Well, thank you all for showing up here. Um, first thing I want to do is uh, call out my co-authors and thank them, Maggie Gill and John Moore for helping with the image analysis associated with this. On the screen, I've got this beautiful image of uh, actually some Mount Simon sandstone that we CT scanned and isolated the connected pore space. Makes for a very nice picture, but it actually has nothing to do with what I'm going to present. But uh, I do like to show this to begin with because it is very nice. Uh, before I get going, I do want to say where I'm coming from, and that's the National Energy Technology Laboratory, specifically the Office of Research and Development. A lot of people know NETL for uh, funding opportunity announcements and various uh, aspects of getting uh, research funded throughout many avenues. I'm not coming from that. I'm coming from a lab rat, someone who's actually in there in the lab doing the work. We have three facilities, one in Morgantown, West Virginia, one in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and one in Albany, Oregon. And we work on various things, including fuel cells, carbon storage, carbon capture, et cetera, and so forth. Within the Geological and Environmental Systems Group, which I'm coming from, we have a number of capabilities, including multi-scale, multi-component modeling, uh, experimental evaluation of natural and engineered materials, and field measurements. And the reason why I went from the bottom up there is there is a recent technical report that one of my uh, co-workers, Richard Hammock, recently put out on uh, some hydraulic uh, fracturing that occurred in Greene County, Pennsylvania that's available on our site. Again, not what I'm talking about here, but it's a very interesting study that uh, might be of interest to those within the audience, and I would highly recommend going to the NETL site and the library and looking for the Greene County uh, hydraulic fracturing test that recently came out the last couple of, uh, I guess, months now. But again, not what I'm talking about. Uh, in red is the computed imaging facility, and that's where I work, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Within that facility, what we try to do is capture data at the small scale, uh, use data conversion, computational flow dynamics, fluid dynamics to develop relationships that are applicable at the large scale. Typically, the, uh, the tools that we use are the CT scanners within our micro scale data collection facility. Uh, we use various in house image processing codes and image shay to uh, isolate the physical phenomena of interest, port that into things like this uh, bebop and fluid flow through a rough fracture, which is CO2 pushing brine out of a rough fracture geometry, develop relative permeability curves or other relationships that can then be uh, scaled up to the kilometer and larger scale for something that's relevant beyond what we can observe within the laboratory. Uh, the tool set that we get to use is shown right here. We are fortunate enough to have three CT scanners that we work with. Uh, the micro CT scanner is capable of doing sub-micron resolution. Um, as was the title slide, the little image down there in the lower left where we're looking at the isolated pore space. Again, we can port that into some computational fluid dynamic simulations, understand how changes in wettability or flow rate can affect fluid saturation at a very small scale. Uh, micro scanner is great for capturing that sub-micron resolution, but typically you deal with something smaller than the diameter of a pencil and scans take a uh, significant amount of time. The industrial CT scanner is what we actually use for this project. Uh, we can get down to about a three micron resolution. Typically we work around a 15 to 30 micron resolution, and that's primarily because we put our cores inside of uh, Hasser style core holders, bring them up to the pressure that we're interested in evaluating, and uh, have the ability to do flow with them. Uh, what's in the upper left corner is some examples of recent work that we've done looking at CO2 migration through uh, some of these cores dynamically and also evaluating uh, fracture squeezing, which I'll talk about in a second. And then finally, we have had a medical scanner at our facility for roughly 12 years at this point. Uh, much coarser scale resolution than the other two scanners, but it does allow us to do very rapid scanning and very uh, large amounts of core scanning in a short amount of time. And that has a resolution 250 to 350 microns. Uh, so for the Hasser style core holder, this is an example I like to show. Uh, again, not a shale, a coal. And we're looking at a piece of coal that we put inside of the Hasser core holder. Um, I've isolated out the mineral zones in red and the fracture zones in this coal in blue. And what we're showing right here is the application of pressure to this coal sample, where all those fractures uh, squeezed shut and disappeared. And that's the condition that we ran our, ran our test on. For this case, it was actually a CO2 sorption into the coal matrix test, uh, but it's a good representation of how we apply that confining pressure to the system uh, within the core holder that's shown in the diagram on the lower left. Uh, core goes inside of a rubber sleeve. You have an annulus of high pressure, ability to do fluid flow. Uh, through that system. So to the work at hand, 
uh, we were interested in looking at how fractures change when they are stressed in various fashions. Uh, for our initial work, we just wanted to make sure that we could isolate out the distribution of apertures within the sample reasonably well. So what we're looking at here, and I'm sorry there's not a scale bar, but we're looking at three rotating fractures that were isolated from some CT scans, uh, one inch diameter, a couple inch in length, uh, shaley limestone fractures created within the laboratory. The hot colors represent larger aperture zones within this uh, fracture. And then, as you can see, sequentially, we started off at uh, ambient conditions, squeezed this with a 600 PSI confining pressure around it to reduce the overall aperture, and uh, then brought that back and saw a significant amount of hysteresis when going through that cycle. So we were very happy in being able to isolate and uh, understand what was going on within these fractures. And that led us to looking at further cycles of uh, fracture squeezing over the course of several days this took us. Um, but then we also wanted to couple this with changes in transmissivity within the actual sample itself. Uh, again, these were one inch diameter samples with a couple inch in length, uh, very low matrix permeability and porosity. And what we initially did was cycle the pressure through uh, four cycles up to 600 PSI and then back down to roughly 10 PSI to keep a small amount of uh, pressure on the sample. And what we've got on the lower part of the screen there is a uh, effective aperture that was measured of these fractures, both at the high pressure and the low pressure. So what we were able to do is uh, isolate these apertures quite well. And again, this is rotating around, but you get an idea of how that aperture geometry changed as we squeeze this over the course of the test. So starting off at uh, the 10 PSI and then squeezing it down, you see there's a fairly open zone up near the top inlet of the sample, and it kind of squeezes down towards the bottom. And then you have these asperities that close and shut, close and shut as we go through the cycling process. And what we observed is when we uh, did this squeezing, after about the second or third cycle, we saw very little change in the fracture, fracture geometry. Um, with the asperities kind of smoothing out and uh, staying essentially constant after the first couple of uh, cycles that we did. We did see some degradation of these asperities, especially near the inlet zone. And uh, yeah, so we saw essentially a constant structure after the first couple of uh, scans. But what we were unable to see was uh, very good transmissivity readings of these. Uh, the system that we had set up when we did these tests was not able to measure the low uh, pressure drop across this, the core on the conditions within the CT scanner. So what we needed to do was improve our differential pressure uh, measurements. And that's what we did with our second series of tests. Uh, this was a test that we did with a smaller core sample, a slightly smoother core sample, a Marcella shale sample that we obtained uh, from an outcrop. Very low matrix porosity and permeability once again. Um, after the first cycle, uh, which you sh can see in the upper right, we, which was up to 1,200 PSI, we observed that we weren't seeing a very large change in the structure, so we increased the uh, amount of pressure that we added to this fracture to 2,000 for the subsequent two cycles. Only did three cycles in this case because we didn't see in the previous test a large amount of change after the first couple of cycles. Uh, so what we're looking at right now is a CT scan of the fracture under just 10 PSI. You can see some uh, mineral filled fractures that are perpendicular to the primary fracture which we created within the lab. Um, at 10 PSI we can isolate this fracture quite nicely from the overall matrix. It was easy to see, easy to uh, develop an aperture map from it. Um, and we could also measure a pressure drop across this tight fracture quite well with the system that we had set up at the time that we ran these tests. So we saw a minimal change in the fracture flow resistance during the cycling that we did, plateauing out down around uh, 10, or, yeah, 10 to the negative 13 uh, for a transmissivity value. But we did see very little change in the fracture. And the primary reason that we saw very little change in the fracture was it was such a tight, smooth fracture to begin with that even when we squeezed this up to 2,000 PSI, we just did not see, we're not able to pull out or 
measure the uh, aperture distribution very well from the, the CT scans that we got. So that's actually a work in progress, and I went through that faster than I intended to, but sorry about that. <laughs> um, we were able to discern changes in the fracture and geometry and transmissivity within these cores, just not at the same time, which was a little <laughs> upsetting for the test that we tried to do. If the fracture was large and rough, it was very easy to isolate that geometry, but the pressure drop was just so small that we couldn't really tell what we were doing. Uh, if the fracture was smooth and small, it was very hard to isolate that geometry from the CT scans that we performed. So we're looking to find that happy medium for the uh, test that we're doing right now. And uh, what we did see, which you know, is fairly well known, that there was very little change in the geometry or flow within these fractures after several cycles of squeezing that were performed. Uh, I want to thank Brian Tennant specifically for helping with the CT scanning work and there's a nice static image of some of the aperture distributions we were able to isolate shown on the screen here and plenty of time left. <laughs> we have a whole three minutes and 50 seconds for Ooh. questions, for, so you're lucky. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for Dustin? Okay, so the fractures are essentially planar. They were created in the lab using a modified Brazilian technique. Um, I believe these were parallel to the bedding plane, so you get kind of a nice uh, linear structure to them. The fracture towards the inlet at the top of the images that we're seeing there are larger, the higher asperities, or I'm sorry, higher uh, aperture readings in those, and then we have various asperities throughout the entire fracture itself that, as they close and open, uh, tended to be in the same places. If that helps. Were your measurements, and sorry, your measurements of permeability were at, at the higher pressure at the, at the lower pressure? At both the higher and lower pressure, the system that we have is able to measure the pressure drop across the, uh, the core. Unfortunately, we, what we saw with this fracture was the pressure drop was so low that the gauges we had in place were not capable of measuring. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it was at both high pressure and low pressure for confining that we were met doing the uh, differential pressure measurements, but we were, for this case, unable to see a significant change above noise in the system. Cool. Any other questions? Then we'll let you off the hook. Oh, thank you. <laughs>